Thank you, Michael. Um, it's a privilege to share this stage with these four great justices, uh, several of whom I go back with more than 40 years, which is remarkable if you consider the fact that none of us have reached 50 years old. <laughs> when Sal Richardoni called us and asked us to put this panel together, he gave us an impossible task. We, we were asked to cover 50 years of Supreme Judicial Court jurisprudence in 45 minutes. So on our first conference call, our panelists made two executive decisions. Justice Cordy, am I permitted to say that uh, under the separation of powers clause? You may proceed. Come All on. right. <laughs> the first decision was to forego the lengthy uh, formal introductions that often accompany events such as this. You all know these folks. Th their biographies are fully described in the materials. They wanted to spend their valuable time speaking to you on issues of substance. The second decision the panel made was to be selective rather than encyclopedic in their treatment of the subject matter. From the universe of potential topics they might have addressed, the justices have chosen five areas of law on which they plan to speak for about seven or eight minutes each. Justice Graney agreed to kick off the session by discussing some of the more important differences between the Massachusetts Constitution and our U.S. federal constitution, either in the text of the document or as applied. Justice Graney. Thank you, Richard. Um, we're celebrating birthdays today, so it's appropriate to celebrate the birthday of the Massachusetts Constitution, which is now 238 years old. So we shall talk uh, about some of the differences in that constitution and how it varies from the federal constitution. It was adopted in 1780. Everyone seems to agree that its principal architect was John Adams. And Adams knew what he was doing uh, because he wanted to set in place a structure for the government of Massachusetts that would fit its citizens for a long period of time. So how did he do this and how does it differ from the federal counterparts in some important aspects? First of all, you remember Adams had lived through the crucible of the Revolutionary War. Uh, if lost, would have probably been hung as for treason. So he wanted to begin with a very robust uh, statement of the rights of the people of Massachusetts. So the first part of our Constitution, which I commend to you to read, is the Declaration of Rights. Uh, it is not as the federal constitution is uh, in its Bill of Rights an afterthought because as you know the Bill of Rights came four years after the formal constitution was approved on the federal level. So the Declaration of Rights as I said sets out uh, what we as citizens and residents of Massachusetts can expect. It begins with a very robust statement of uh, equal protection the original clause said that all people are born free and equal. The word people, when he wrote it, was men, and that was amended to people, and have certain natural, essential, and inalienable rights, among them the right of enjoying lives and liberties and seeking and obtaining safety and happiness. It was expanded in 1976 with the adoption of the Equal Rights Amendment which, in, which said that equality under the law shall not be denied or abridged because of sex, race, color, creed, or natural origin. Uh, notice the difference in the language of that statement of equal protection from the federal counterpart, which by the way was not adopted until after the Civil War. There are other important differences, and I'll highlight some. If you look at the Confrontation Clause in the Declaration of Rights, it says that in a criminal trial, all defendants will be entitled to meet the witnesses against them face to face. The Sixth Amendment, its counterpart in the Federal Constitution, says the defendant has a right to confront the witnesses against him. So what's the big deal between the two? Well, an example of the big deal between the two occurred in the Amaral trial, which my court, my old court, heard, uh, heard on appeal in 1997. 
That occurred in the era where children, because it was thought they would be terribly traumatized if they had to face their molester or abuser, were allowed to sit in chairs or otherwise uh, with their backs to the defendant as they testified or were otherwise uh, shielded from him. Uh, the, you know, the federal cases under the federal counterpart that I just read to you uh, said uh, that was perfectly all right. That satisfied the confrontation clause. In the Amaral clause uh, case, we said no, it does not satisfy the Constitution. Uh, and there, Justice Freed, writing for the court, pointed out why we were taking a separate path indicating that the literal language of face-to-face -face meant face-to-face. -face. Those of you who are into constitutional interpretation, that would be a perfect example of what we call textualism, where the text dictates the result. So we have a separate uh, separation of powers provision, which Justice Cordy will talk about a little bit more, that expressly states that the various branches of government will not interfere with each other within their respective spheres. Uh, the United States Constitution has no such provision. Uh, that's been sort of interpreted out of the various other provisions of the Constitution. We have an education clause, which is not no counterpart in the federal Constitution, which says in substance that the legislatures will cherish the interests of promoting education. In the McDuffie case, we had to struggle with what did the word, cher the verb cherish mean? Was it precatory? Could the legislature just sort of control the whole thing with it, its expenditures? Or was it mandatory and could we order them in effect to do better? We went back and consulted dictionaries, sources in 1780, uh, and came up with the conclusion that the verb was mandatory. That, if you are follow interpretive scholarship, was an example of originalism. We have an anti-aid amendment that was adopted in 1888, which says in substance that public funds will not be used to assist religion or religious organizations in any significant way. Uh, and that was recently applied by my old court to declare that in a grant from a historic preservation fund to a church to renovate its stained glass windows, which were historical in purpose uh, and nature, uh, could not be sustained under the anti-aid amendment. Just think of how different things would be if the federal courts had a similar provision struggling with how to separate religion from government. Um, and finally, uh, we explained in the Gonsalves case, which is now there, why we can march more or less to our own drummer under the Massachusetts Constitution when we are permitted to do so uh, and not uh, uh, follow the dictates of the federal, uh, the United States Supreme Court in similar areas. This quotation you see on the screen explains in part why we can do that Principally, it says, our Constitution was adopted seven years before the federal Constitution, so by the nature of simple antiquity, we can do within our sphere what we want to do. And secondly, as the quote from Chief Justice Wilkins points out, uh, the, the federal Constitution in its own domain creates a floor uh, but we are allowed to go above that floor because it doesn't stop us at a ceiling. And I would add two other final observations on why we can do this. The first is the Tenth Amendment to the United States Constitution, which guarantees sovereignty to the states in all matters within their jurisdiction, and that includes not only legislative or executive matters, but matters decided by the courts. And finally, our values are different than the values that might pertain on the national level. So that's a brief look at our Constitution, and I commend you to read it, particularly the Declaration of Rights.
Thank you, Justice Grady. Uh, let me mention for the folks standing in the back, there are plenty of seats in the front of the hall. Justice Cordy, you agreed to discuss separation of powers, and you chose to entitle your remarks, Respectful Conversations Between the Branches. Tell us, if you would, about some of those conversations. Sure. Um, the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary, in the same hands may justly be pronounced the very def definition of tyranny. That's James Madison. The judicial power ought to be distinct from both the legislative and executive, and independent of both, so it may be a check upon both, as both should be checks upon it. John Adams, thoughts on government. Hence the 1780 Massachusetts Declaration of Rights, most clearly of all, declares, I won't repeat the whole thing, but just the relevant part, the judicial shall never exercise the legislative and executive powers or either of them, to the end, it may be a government of laws and not of men. At some level, however, these branches are truly independent, dependent, independent, and interdependent. At some level, they must work together, they have shared responsibilities, and they are truly interdependent. Who enacts the laws that the judiciary is to apply and interpret? Who establishes the various courts other than the Supreme Judicial Court and the number of judges for each court? Who funds the operation and capital needs of the courts? The legislature. Who enforces and implements the laws and who must execute judicial rulings regarding the implementation of those laws? It's the executive. Are we to operate in Andrew Jackson's 1832 Trail of Tears conundrum Mr. Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it? I hope not. I hope we never get there, here or in other places. My view is that while an independent judiciary must be courageous, it also must be respectful of the roles of the other branches, as they must be of its role. Otherwise, we have a breakdown in what we envision as a well-functioning constitutional democracy. And truly, the roles of the three branches even with respect to the making of the law, were never completely separate. Recall that the common law is indeed judge-made law, and it predominated in the 18th and 19th centuries until statutes and regulations began to overtake it. But this transition could be delicate and harmful to the citizens if not done mindfully and in some respects collaboratively. So going back 50 years to the very foundation of this organization, we see first two striking things in the transition from longstanding and important common law rules to statutory frameworks, frameworks more suitable to the times. First, the doctrine of charitable immunity, common law doctrine of longstanding, designed to ensure that charities in the 19th century were not burdened and stripped bare of their resources by litigation and claims against them. While it may have suited the times well, the 20th century saw a dramatic change in the size and wealth of charitable institutions, which now included conglomerates, especially in the health field. And great injuries suffered by individuals from time to time by the negligence of such institutions with little remedy was palpably unjust. So the court in 1969, having repeatedly recognized the recurring injustice of the application of the common law rule, essentially spoke to the legislature through an opinion, Colby versus Kearney Hospital. While dismissing a tort case against Kearney Hospital, it put the legislature and the broader legal community on notice that the next time it squarely confronted the legal question respecting the charitable immunity doctrine, it was the court's intention of abolishing it. Helpfully, it also noted in a footnote a New Jersey statute capping liability in such circumstances. Hint, hint. <laughs> well, the legislature took the hint and abolished the doctrine while creating its own liability cap. Four years later, 1973, in Marash versus Commonwealth, the court similarly put the legislature on notice that the rule of sovereign immunity might also be abolished by the court, absent a comprehensive approach to the problem by the legislature, which the court stated would be preferable. And indeed, a few years later, Massachusetts 
the Massachusetts legislature enacted the Tort Claims Act. Important conversations regarding the constitutional function of making the laws work for the people. Switching gears to a more complex situation, but also one in which the court understood its role and shared responsibility, this time for ensuring the provision of public education in the Commonwealth. Justice Graney mentioned the McDuffie case of 1993, a very important case, and I think a wonderful example of the court exercising its important responsibility of first interpreting a clause in the Massachusetts Constitution to mean that the provision of public education was an enforceable duty on the legislative and executive branches. Second, finding that the duty was not being adequately performed, where the Commonwealth had essentially delegated the responsibility for public school education to local communities, and its system of funding relied almost exclusively on local property taxes, which left students in poor communities with insufficient resources and educational opportunities. But the court did not go on to devise a funding plan of its own that it felt would be constitutionally adequate. Rather, it recognized the line of separation between declaring a responsibility and implementing it. It left to the other two branches to create a new legislative scheme to provide adequate resources and accountability to fulfill the constitutional imperative. Surely the court would have been out of its depth, both technically and constitutionally, to undertake that responsibility themselves. Indeed, I was legal counsel to Bill Weld at the time. We had been spending months negotiating with Senator Birmingham over the Education Reform Act of 1993, and just before we were to roll it out, the court decides the McDuffie case. Ta-da! Magic. It all came together. Okay, last. Twelve years later, after substantial and sustained reforms in funding and performance accountability mechanisms in our public education system, a new challenge was mounted, claiming the Commonwealth still had not fulfilled its obligations. The case was Hancock versus Commissioner of Education. The court recognized the extraordinary efforts that had been undertaken by the Commonwealth since 1993 and its trajectory of progress. While the court acknowledged that shortcomings still existed, it concluded that those shortcomings did not constitute the egregious statewide abandonment of the constitutional duty identified in the McDuffie case. In short, the court acknowledged its own limitations and would not intervene, and I would say was not equipped to do so, in the making of difficult funding decisions and dealing with the other complexities of managing the system where the other branches were proceeding purposefully, measurably, and in good faith to do so, respecting the roles of both, respecting conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Cordy. Plenty of seats down front, folks. Uh, Chief Justice Gantz agreed to speak about the court's efforts over the years to reduce the number of wrongful criminal convictions. Chief? Thank you, Z. Sacco and Vanzetti were executed in 1927, but their legacy lives in the SJC. Those convictions were so controversial in their day that 200,000 people either joined or watched the funeral march that carried their caskets from Boston's North End to burial in the Forest Hills Cemetery. We get those crowds only for duck boats after a Patriots championship. <laughs> In the aftermath of those executions, it is fair to say that half of the residents of Massachusetts were angry that they were executed, and the other half were angry that it took so long to execute them. Ours is probably the only Supreme Court in the nation which has an exhibit in the lobby of our courthouse about a murder case in which there continues to be a debate 90 years later as to whether those defendants were wrongfully convicted. The immediate legacy of their case was the enactment of a statute 12 years later, General Laws Chapter 278, Section 33E, that requires the SJC to review all first-degree murder cases for a substantial likelihood of a miscarriage of justice, which means that the justice who is writing the opinion examines the entire transcript of the trial to ensure that the trial was fair and to look for potential prejudicial errors that were missed by the appellate attorney. The more enduring legacy is that I can say with confidence that no Supreme Court in the United States, and that certainly includes the Supreme Court of the United States, 
has done more to attempt to reduce the risk of wrongful convictions than the SJC. I will begin with mistaken eyewitness identification, which according to the Innocence Project, and as noted in a footnote by Justice Cordy a number of years ago, is the leading cause of wrongful convictions accounting for approximately 72% of exonerations. As to the admissibility of an out-of-court eyewitness identification, the United States Supreme Court has allowed the admission of those identifications that arise from unnecessarily suggestive police procedures so long as it passes the reliability test, which judges find it almost always does. But the SJC declared in Commonwealth v. Johnson in 1995 that Article 12 of our Declaration of Rights requires a per se rule of exclusion for identifications that result from unnecessarily suggestive police procedures, both to deter police mis misconduct and sloppiness and to provide stronger protection against wrongful convictions. When an out-of-court identification is made under especially suggestive circumstances that are not caused by the police, we have given a judge the authority under our common law principles of fairness to weigh the risk of undue prejudice arising from the suggestiveness of the, of the ID against the strength of its independent source and determine whether the ID is so unreliable that it would be unfair for a jury to give it any weight in their evaluation of the evidence. And when the judge decides it would be unfair, the judge must rule that ID to be inadmissible. Where there is no out-of-court ID, or only an equivocal out-of-court ID, we have barred eyewitnesses from making an in-court identification of a defendant where identification is truly at issue in the case because it is an incredibly suggestive show-up ID. We were the first court in the nation to recognize that an in-court ID is really a show-up ID. We have said that where we would not allow a prosecutor on the day before trial to bring the defendant into a witness room and ask the witness if that is the guy who committed the crime, we should not allow the prosecutor to do the same thing during the course of trial. Where the ID is equally suggestive and where it will likely be given weight it does not deserve by a jury and where the witness's certainty will almost certainly be greater than it would have been in any different setting. Where the eyewitness identification is admitted, we provide juries with model eyewitness ID instructions that set forth principles that have, adopted, that, that have been adopted by a near consensus in the relevant scientific community to help them to evaluate the accuracy of eyewitness IDs. Now, in, in most cases, we invoke juries simply to use their common sense to evaluate the evidence. The problem is that with eyewitness IDs, much of what is commonly believed about human memory and about the accuracy of eyewitness IDs has been found to be wrong. In federal court and in the court of courts of the vast majority of states, juries are kept in the dark about scientific principles that are accepted by virtually every eyewitness expert unless the defendant calls an eyewitness expert to testify, which they almost never do and could not possibly do because there were far, far too experts to testify in every case in which eyewitness ID is an issue at trial. We help juries in their difficult task to evaluate the evidence and the accuracy of an eyewitness ID by giving them the accepted, silence, the accepted science. And I note that although we adopted the model eyewitness ID instructions in 2015, the path for it was paved in 1997 in an opinion, Commonwealth versus Sintoli, written by Chief Justice Wilkins, that declared, we recognize that a principle concerning eyewitness IDs may become so generally accepted that rather than have expert testimony on the point, a standard jury instruction stating that principle would be appropriate. We have used our superintendent's authority to discourage police investigative methods that increase the risk of wrongful convictions. We have noted that the superintendent's authority of this court does not extend to law enforcement agencies. We cannot mandate what they must or must not do, but we can mandate what the consequences will be in a court of law where they fail to follow our guidance. 
And through that superintendent's authority, we have warned police against using a photo spread in which all the persons depicted are suspects, because then a mistaken ID will identify a person who was a suspect in the investigation, or which depict fewer than six persons. And we have encouraged police to tape record interrogations, which not only provides a near perfect record of what actually was said by the police and the suspect, and a record of how they both behaved during the course of the interview, but also makes it easier for a jury to evaluate the risk of a false confession. Recently, we have demonstrated in, in the Bridgman line of cases that where there is laboratory misconduct that potentially may have tainted thousands of drug convictions, we will vacate those convictions and order new trials. And just last week, we demonstrated that where there is both laboratory misconduct that potentially may have tainted thousands more drug convictions, and prosecutorial misconduct that concealed the potential scope of that misconduct from defense counsel and from the DAs who prosecuted the case, we will vacate those convictions and dismiss them with prejudice. I do not have time to discuss the other areas that we have discussed, with, but I will add only that <clears throat> to reduce wrongful convictions is a matter not only of changing the law, but also changing the culture of police and prosecutors. And it is hoped that both, <clears throat> and we have been blessed, actually, with police and prosecutors who have adopted that culture, uh, in part because of their own understanding of the importance of it, but nudged a little bit by the SJC. And I believe my time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice. <clears throat> Let's stick with the criminal law for a moment. Justice Cowan, over the last 50 years, there's been a great increase in the protections afforded to criminal defendants. Which do you view as the most important cases in which the Supreme Judicial Court has interpreted the law in ways that increase protections for those accused of crimes? Rich, as you said, the Supreme Judicial Court has interpreted the law to increase the rights of criminal defendants in many areas in the last 50 years. Time permits me to discuss only a few of them, and I will restrict myself to those subjects in which the Supreme Judicial Court itself has made a difference under the state constitution or otherwise. I won't discuss cases in which our court has merely adopted federal jurisprudence. Starting at the beginning of a criminal case with the issue of bail, the matter came up just last year in Commonwealth versus Brangan, B-R-A-N-G-A-N. This case considered the relevance of a defendant's financial resources as one factor, among others, in setting bail. The court stated that our common law, as well as constitutional principles, mandate that a judge must consider the defendant's financial resources in setting bail. Bail must be calculated to assure the defendant's presence at future proceedings and must be based on the individual character and circumstances of each defendant, including the defendant's financial circumstances. The court further held that while a defendant has no constitutional right to have bail set in an amount the defendant can afford, the judge must set forth findings of fact and a statement of reasons whenever the judge sets bail beyond the defendant's ability um, to pay. While the Supreme Court has said for some time that the ability of the defendant to make bail is a factor, Brangan is the first case in which the Supreme Judicial Court has emphasized the importance of this factor. The court stated that the judge cannot set bail that the defendant cannot make as a means of keeping the defendant off the street. If the judge is going to set bail in an amount that the defendant cannot make, the judge must make findings explaining the reasons why that is, explaining that one or more of the other factors that may be considered in setting bail overcomes the financial factor. The trial courts have developed forms to assist the judges in complying with the Brangan requirements. And the Governor Baker's criminal justice reform bill of last year added a new paragraph to the bail statute codifying the Brangan requirements. Moving to another subject, in Commonwealth versus Webster, a case that governed some of our criminal jury instructions for almost two centuries, the court used the term to a moral certainty in defining the meaning of beyond a reasonable doubt. Then in 2015, in Commonwealth versus Russell, 
the Supreme Judicial Court made what I consider a substantial change in the meaning of the term moral certainty in this context, a change which in my view appears quite certainly to favor the defendant. The old Webster charge set forth by Chief Justice Shaw stated that moral certainty was, and I quote, a certainty that convinces and directs the understanding and satisfies the reason and judgment of those who are bound to act conscious, conscientiously upon it. And we judges uh, use that decision for hundreds of years. The Russell decision mandates that judges now define moral certainty as, and I quote, the highest degree of certainty possible in matters relating to human affairs, unquote. This new definition seems to me to increase significantly the Commonwealth's burden of proof. Whether it does so will likely never be known, unless a study were to be made of the results of criminal cases in one county or another before the adoption of this definition compared to results after the use of the new language and such a study would obviously need to take into account other variables that might render any change difficult to measure. A very significant case predates our 50-year period here by just one year, but the case made such a change in our law that I think it should not be ignored. In 1967, in Commonwealth versus Freeman, in an opinion written by Justice Cutter, the court changed criminal appellate practice by introducing the phrase, referred to uh, a minute ago by Chief Justice Gantz, the phrase substantial risk of a miscarriage of justice to be used for reviewing unpreserved errors. Prior to that case, it was rare for an appellate court to consider, let alone grant relief, based on a claim of error that had not been preserved by an objection in the trial court and by a rigorous technical procedure on appeal. It is now standard for our appellate courts to review all claims of error, whether preserved in the trial court or not. Of course, a different standard of review, one more favorable to the defendant, is applied in those cases in which the error has been preserved than in those cases in which it has not been. The prosecution of criminal cases has changed, indeed been revolutionized, by the advances in science and technology of the last several decades. The court has adapted several principles of law to the developments in computers, cell phones, surveillance technology such as the GPS, and the availability of new forensic testing. One such recent case is Commonwealth versus Augustine. This case recognized a reasonable expectation of privacy in one's historical cell site location information, which is derived from one's cellular telephone. Thus, the court required the police to get a warrant in order to obtain this type of information from the cell phone service provider to identify the phones and presumably the defendant's whereabouts for anything other than a brief period of time. Our court has also adopted decisions to protect the rights of criminal defendants several years prior to the time the United States Supreme Court has done so. Two such examples are the familiar cases of Commonwealth versus Soares and Commonwealth versus Safarian. In the Soares case, the Supreme Judicial Court established a framework under Article 12 of the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights for assuring that peremptory challenges are not used improperly to exclude persons from trial juries on the basis of race, gender, color, creed, or national origin. The Soares decision was issued seven years before the Supreme Court reached a similar decision in Batson versus Kentucky. Commonwealth versus Safarian set forth the standard for determining whether the defendant had received effective assistance of counsel. The court explained the standard as follows. There must be a discerning examination and appraisal of the specific circumstances of the given case to see whether there has been serious incompetency, inefficiency, or inattention of counsel, behavior of counsel falling measurably below that which might be expected from the ordinary and fallible lawyer. And if that is found, 
then typically whether it has likely deprived the defendant of an otherwise available substantial ground of defense. This decision came 10 years before the United States <coughs> Supreme Court's decision in Strickland versus Washington, adopting essentially the same standard. I hope my response has been helpful. Thank you, Justice Cowan. <clears throat> and finally, Justice Graney, we're back to you to take us home. Some of the SJC's most important cases have been in the area of individual rights and family law, including the critical issues of same gender adoption and marriage. Tell us about those cases. Okay, it's appropriate that we end, I think, with, on the subject of <coughs> adoption and uh, Goodrich marriage, uh, because it is, of course, one of the most significant cases that have, has been decided in the history of the court. Uh, the path to Goodrich began with adoption of Tammy in 1993, 10 years before Goodrich was decided. And the issue in that case was whether two women, both of whom were doctors, could adopt uh, the biological child of one of them. Uh, <clears throat> in other words, could there be same sex or same gender adoption? I wrote the decision for the court. It was a split decision, four to three. And I was able to uh, hold that it could, this could be done, by simple statutory analysis. I did not have to go into the Constitution to do it, and I won't spend the time to get into the details. The next step occurred in 1999, six years later, when our sister state, Vermont, in Baker versus State, decided that uh, an accommodation should be made for same-gender marriage, but the accommodation uh, would be civil unions, not actual marriage. And many states thought that that was the solution, perhaps, to this emerging and critical social issue. But then in 2003, a divided court, my court, uh, in the Goodrich case, decided that uh, civil unions would not uh, be satisfactory. Um, and that same-gender marriage should be authorized under the principles of the Massachusetts Constitution. There is on the screen an excerpt from Chief Justice Marshall's opinion that I will not get into in great detail, but that excerpt emphasizes the dignity and the role that marriage plays in our society and why the court uh, considered the case so important that it reached the result that it did. Basically, Judge Chief Justice Marshall's approach was to look at the three reasons offered by the Attorney General in defense of the prohibition in the statute. The first was providing uh, that uh, traditional marriage provided a favorable uh, setting for procreation, and she explained why it did not. The second was that it was an optimal settle, uh, setting for child rearing, and she explained that that did not justify it either, uh, guided particularly by the thousands of adoptions that had occurred since the time of the Tammy case. And the third reason offered by the state was, well, it preserves scarce state financial resources. Well, you can't pr preserve uh, state financial resources by taking away the constitutional rights of others, she explained. There's an excerpt on the screen from my concurring opinion, which is the only time I ventured into this territory. I felt so strongly about the issue that I concluded the opinion by what you see on the screen, which was a plea to all our citizens to accept this and accept our neighbors and friends and others who uh, were going to enter same-gender marriage uh, without denigrating them in any significant way. And I was happy to do that. The path I took was a little bit different in the opinion than Chief Justice Marshall. I, we both agreed that marriage is a highly ranked fundamental right but I thought under the equal protection provisions that we talked about a little bit earlier when we started, um, that th we could take a more direct path by looking at the prohibition in the statute as a classification 
that involved gender and therefore one that involved a higher degree of scrutiny under the state constitution and the state could offer no compelling reason, in my opinion, to justify the statute. Three justices dissented and they were very good dissents without the acrimony that you see in the dissents of our the United States Supreme Court. They followed basically the path that the statute had a legitimate purpose, the traditional statute, and therefore should be respected. And secondly, that the separation of powers that Judge Cordy spoke about should also be respected, to use his words, and that a momentous decision such as Goodrich should be made in the first, inter inter uh, the first time by the legislature and not by us. Now everyone thought that was the end of the matter with Goodrich, but there's an epilogue. Um, two other decisions followed. The legislature sent to us a proposed piece of legislation uh, which indicated that they were willing to adopt civil unions if we would back off of uh, traditional marriage. And in a unanimous decision, joined by the three justices who had dissented, I think written by Justice Cowan, we said absolutely not, that won't work. The second one was a proposed initiative by gr a group or groups that wanted to uh, insert a provision in the Massachusetts Constitution to effect nullify our decision. And in the Massachusetts Constitution, there is a gatekeeper provision that says that before the initiative uh, can get on a constitutional matter can get on the ballot for the voters to vote, it has to pass a two-thirds requirement in both branches of the legislature. And the legislature, to their non-credit, didn't want to vote because they thought they would lose if they voted one way or they would lose if they voted the other way. So a lawsuit was brought, and I wrote the opinion on that one, saying you have to vote, you took an oath to vote, because we can't imprison you if you don't vote. And finally they did, and they did not allow the proposed initiative to go forward. And finally there was a backlash uh, to the whole opinion, and I'll conclude with this. The first, uh, f we have relative anonymity. On the day the opinion was released, um, there were, because notice had come it was going to be released, there were competing rallies on the front uh, part of the courthouse, proponents and opponents. And I had to go to CVS to get some toothpaste. <laughs> so I walked between these contending factions and no one knew who I was. <laughs> the second bath backlash, not to get into the emails that we received, <laughs> particularly from the South, um, was that the publisher of Lawyers Weekly at the time, a very wealthy man, uh, was dreadfully against the Goodrich case. So he hired an airplane to fly over my house, trailing a banner that said, Impeach Judge Graney and it flew there for two or three weeks, including over the Eastern States Exposition, which is one of the largest attended fairs in the Northeast. I do have one regret, and one regret only, about the Goodrich decision. I wish we could re have released it this year, because I would love to see the tweets that would come out of the White House. <laughs> Thank you, Justices. I think our work here is done. Thank you, Richard, and our distinguished legal panel for that thoughtful review. I, I have to tell you, when the idea was conceived to do a uh, 
review of 50 years of legal developments in 45 minutes, we had absolutely no idea how you could do it, but we knew we had the right panel. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.